Today, we're going to be talking about isolated grounds. What's the challenge of isolated grounds? Well, an isolated ground can be a mystery for anyone who does not understand the electrical principles behind the isolated ground. Explain what an isolated ground is for us. Well, an isolated ground is simply a ground wire that does not connect electrically to any point except back at the ground of either the separately derived ground point or at the building service. Uh, the idea is to have no loops where current can flow or be induced to create a gradient in the ground wire. What opportunities are there if you understand the principles of isolated grounds? Well, the most simple opportunity is to simply get it designed correctly so that it actually works as an isolated ground. And under some circumstances, if you really understand how it works, uh, you might be able to say, well, we don't really need it and eliminate it, thus save some money. What's the story behind isolated grounds? Well, I, th I think it would be appropriate to, to start with a little history. Back in the 80s, when computers were becoming more common, uh, big mainframes with terminals uh, distributed out through a building, and oftentimes these buildings were very large, and the distances between terminals and the mainframes uh, were such that any voltage difference or voltage gradient between one part of the building and another would show up in the ground and thus be imposed on the signals between the terminals and the mainframe. And this would also include, you know, point of sale terminals, etc. And this would end up as noise and it caused uh, problems. And so what they did was they put in isolated grounds where the ground never connected to anything except one point and therefore, no current flowed on the ground, the isolated ground, and thus, there was no voltage difference between the equipment and the terminals. The fact is that it's hard to maintain a ground, and ground wires can, isolated grounds can become corrupted accidentally or just through uh, neglect over time, or, or maybe just not installed correctly, because it's hard to get a wire to go from one spot to another without touching something. Uh, remember, uh, a phase wire, you get a fault if there's a problem. And that happens sometimes and you fix it. But with a ground wire, an isolated ground wire, you'll never know that it's corrupted unless you test for it explicitly, which seldom happens. Let's do a deep dive into isolated grounds. Tell us more about how they work. Well, an isolated ground provides a ground voltage reference that does not vary with voltage gradients within the building. And uh, example of a, of a voltage gradient cause is, is a lightning strike next to the building. There's a voltage at the lightning strike that's the highest and it spreads out in all directions. And as it goes across a building, one side of the building is going to have a higher voltage than the other side. Thus, there will be some current flowing in the building structure, which means it's flowing in the ground conductors. And this actually shows up as a, as a rise in the voltage on the grounded wire. And if your equipment is relative to that grounded wire, your equipment sees that voltage change as well. Another source is simply a transformer outside the building. There's a ground going into the ground and, and there's a certain amount of ground current that flows in that wire for the utilities. And so there is a gradient as you go from a pole outward. And as that gradient crosses a building, uh, it's also seen in the ground system. There's also things, you know, you can get ground currents from radio stations nearby, but if the ground is actually inside a conduit or metal raceway of some sort, uh, the effect of radio stations is fairly minimal. Obviously, you wouldn't have a, an isolated ground in Romex because that would allow uh, radio signals to impinge on the ground wire and thus induce currents and voltage gradients in the isolated ground, which is exactly what we don't want. Where does the isolated ground connect to the ground? The isolated ground needs to connect at either the service main bus, or it needs to connect at the separately derived ground connection of an internal transformer. And the question would be, well, when do you decide whether you take the wire all the way back to the service or whether you just simply go to the nearest transformer? And that's an interesting question that is probably best answered by looking at where you can get the potentials that you don't want to impose on your equipment and 
Well, let's just take an example. Say it's a very large building and you've got a terminal on one edge of the building and a terminal on the other, and there's transformers all over the building. You might want to take your isolated ground all the way back to the main service so that a terminal on one side of the building and a computer on the other side of the building are both looking at the same ground potential through this isolated ground system, which would be back at the main service. Now, if you're a, say you're a retail store and you have a transformer serving your space, well, then you would simply go back to the separately derived ground of the service to your space, since you don't really have any equipment outside your space. So any equipment inside your space would see the same ground potential as your separately derived ground serving the space. And that would be sufficient. And that's actually the more common scenario. I mean, banks often do this uh, where they got one transformer serving the building. And, and so they simply go to the whatever the ground point is for that. So Dave, isolated grounds uh, need to be modeled on the one line diagram. Uh, does ElectroBIM have a way of doing this? All right, let's talk about how you would actually model this and show this on your plans. I wanna start with a framework that we call the electrical design triangle, because this helps us think through where we have to document this. The electrical design triangle has three sides. It has the single line diagram, like you mentioned. That's not the only place that we have things showing up in our electrical design. We've also got our either CAD drawings or our Revit model, depending on whether where you're working. And then you have the calculations. And when you're adding something like an isolated ground to your system, you want to think through where it belongs on each of these sides of the triangle. For an isolated ground, the first place you're going to put this is on the single line diagram because you want to label this on the feeder. So you're going to have your wire call out and you're going to have an isolated ground. You can add that to your wire call out. So you want to make sure that the isolated ground is labeled there so that it's part of your design. If that wire call out shows up on your drawings anywhere, if it's in a home run call out or on your panel schedules, you need to make sure that you transfer that to those as well. And finally, you need to think through whether this is going to impact your calculations. Something like an IG is actually a little bit subtle because it doesn't impact most of the calculations. It's not going to have an impact on the voltage drop or your short circuit analysis or your arc flash. However, it does come into play for the sizing of your conduits because you're adding another wire to your wires. So you want to make sure that your conduit is big enough for that additional wire. So you want to check your conduit size. If you're doing this manually, you're going to add that label to the single line diagram with some text. And you're going to make sure that you can add that text to your CAD drawing or your Revit model. And then you want to make sure on your calculations that you upsize that conduit as well. If you're using something like ElectroBIM in Revit, it handles all of that for you. So I have an example here. We have a simple system that we're looking at. We've got this transformer and then we've got a panel downstream and we want to add an isolated ground to it. So we can take a look at this panel. It's a 125 amp panel. It currently has a one and a half inch conduit with three one aught wires and one aught neutral and a number six ground. You can see that the conduit fill is 39%. So it's right up against that 40% conduit fill. Adding the IG is pretty straightforward. We're gonna add the IG here, change the IG conductor from no to yes. That's going to add our IG conductor to the callout. We're also going to see that the conduit upsizes from an inch and a half to the two inch conduit and our conduit fill then is now 26%. That gets it on the wire callout. Then we need to show that on our single line diagram. So you can see that our wire callout changed from 125 to 125 IG, indicating that this callout has that isolated ground. And over in our feeder schedule, we have a new entry now indicating that additional wire configuration. So we have the 125 without the isolated ground. And then we also have the 125 IG callout for wires that have the isolated ground included. If you have a good NEC ground, why do you need an extra isolated ground? Well, let's start with a simple example. Consider a computer terminal uh, with a metal case. Uh, someone walks up to the to the terminal across a carpet, creates a static charge on the body, touches the cabinet, and discharges a, a little electroshock to the terminal, and that travels all the way back to the ground via the ground system. That in order for current to flow, you've got to have a voltage gradient, which means that the computer uh, terminal that he just touched uh, actually sees a little jump in the voltage of the cabinet and if that is an issue relative to the internal components, then you could get some noise, data errors. It could end up having to reboot the computer. Who knows? But it's not good. Now, the manufacturers uh, oftentimes are now uh, accounting for this by isolating the electronics inside with 
photoelectric or, or optical connectors so that even if there is a current flow on the cabinet, uh, the electronics inside don't actually see it. And this is, this is one of the reasons why um, the isolated ground today is probably not as important for equipment as it used to be. Is it possible to actually achieve an isolated ground? Well, actually, yes, of course it is. Uh, if the craftsman, the electrician is careful about the conductor, make sure that there's no splices in the isolated ground that could come in contact with the J box. You got to remember that an NEC ground, you actually encourage it to touch the raceways and building steel everywhere it can. I mean, the more, more places that a, an NEC ground connects to the rest of the building, the better things are because that gives you a better ground path back to the service, uh, which helps clear the faults. Uh, but for an isolated ground, that's exactly what you don't want. You don't want it to touch anything. So it's obviously got to be an insulated wire and it's got to make it all the way to the end, unconnected to any kind of metal steel uh, or, or the building. So it's possible, but there's a good chance that over time, isolated grounds become corrupted just through wear on a wire or a maintenance person not understanding what the wire is all about. There's all kinds of things that can happen. But yes, it is possible to create a good isolated ground. If isolated grounds are so hard to create, why do we provide them? Well, part of my answer is probably a little cynical. Uh, back in the day, manufacturers of equipment would call for an isolated ground as a condition of warranty. And that was a good thing because back years ago, uh, they really needed the isolated ground for the equipment to work reliably. But today it's not so necessary, but there's a legacy where they still provide it or call for the isolated ground because in some respects, it's an opportunity for manufacturers to deflect uh, warranty calls because the first thing they do is they say, well, do you have a good isolated ground and have you checked it? And, and they can use that as a way to avoid warranty calls. At least that was my experience years ago. I probably don't see it so much anymore. And uh, you know, there's a legacy here. We still provide isolated grounds partly because it's it's in master specifications and it's just ingrained in a legacy that nobody wants to uh, eliminate because the conservative answer is to, well, provide an isolated ground. That's easy and conservative and safe and you'll never get in trouble for doing that, but it may not be necessary and it may be a waste of money. Let's review the important points for isolated grounds. An isolated ground provides a ground reference that does not have any voltage fluctuations caused by noise on the National Electric Code ground, the normal uh, building ground. The point of connection is generally back at the nearest service or separately derived ground point. Clearly the equipment that you connect the isolated ground to must also be designed to accept an isolated ground. Uh, simply tying the isolated ground together with the National Electric Code ground at the equipment just defeats the whole purpose because now you have a perfect loop for current flow. So the equipment needs to actually be designed to accept an isolated ground. The wire needs to be sized per the National Electric Code because it may be called upon to uh, clear a fault. It's not the, at least if there was a fault within the equipment and there was an isolated ground and, and that was the only path back, then it would have to be fully rated. And per National Electric Code uh, section 250.96, the isolated ground does not eliminate the requirement for the normal National Electric Code grounding. So you have to provide, if you're gonna provide an isolated ground, you must also provide the normal raceway system grounding. 